In our previous episodes, we talked about the climate emergency and how it impinges on our human rights, from our right to life to our rights to food and shelter. We've also continued to learn about the importance of climate action to reach climate justice. In this episode, we'll learn about the benefits of a green economy and how it can pave the way towards a better future. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Christine Sabidio, a journalist and advocate, and this is Saving Asia. We're still joined by students from the Philippines and Indonesia, Patricia, Tristan, and Jilan. Unfortunately, Yong and Jess from Malaysia won't be able to join us today. Hello everyone, we've discussed a lot in the last episode. This one is quite different since we're looking at the private sector and businesses and what they can do to perhaps turn the tide in the climate crisis. What are you expecting for today's episode on the green economy? Basically, I'm a single student. I'm just curious about if we want to apply the green economy concept, how much we should spend, how much a company should spend to to move to the the existed, existed economic concept to the green economic concept and how to approach uh, some big company, some large company to to apply this concept as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jelena. That's quite an interesting question. Who wants to go next? Patricia or Tristan? This may sound a bit cheesy, but I want to know your thoughts or ideas on how we can make this world less greedy, you know? I think those companies or the big companies really just think about profit or gaining profit and and how we can you know push them to be more mindful or to care enough for the environment thanks patricia those are very thought-provoking questions um and our last um, panelist among the students tristan since i don't really know about the green economy so I can't wait to hear the experts explaining about the green economy and the benefits of it and what should we do, especially as a youth, to uh, join or implement the green economy and where can we start it and how. I think that's it. Thanks so thank much, you. Tristan. Uh, thank you everyone for your questions and those are really interesting questions. We're very fortunate that we have very capable resource persons today to hopefully answer them. Joining us in this episode is the Assistant Vice President and Head for, for Corporate Social Responsibility at Energy Development Corporation, a renewable energy company in the Philippines and the largest integrated geothermal company in the world, a forester and a lawyer by profession attorney Alan Barsena. We also have Zara Fang, a Sustainable Economy and Policy Analyst at the World Wide Fund for Nature or WWF Malaysia and Denise Fontanilla, a campaigner and communicator for climate action and clean energy. She is currently an associate for policy advocacy at the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities or ICSC. Welcome everyone and thank you for being with us today. Uh, I guess I'll go straight to our questions. Um, the first would be, how is today's economic system jeopardizing the climate condition? And how did it happen? Why are we where we are right now? From our point of view, um and in economics, the, the current economic um, paradigm that we live in is, is a, very much a free market uh, economic paradigm. So people exchange goods, exchange services based on um, you know, what they think the value is. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the, the value of environmental goods and services, so what the environment does for us, isn't actually being captured um, in, in our market society at the moment. Um, so that is one of the main issues, I think, um, causing a lot of the problems between our kind of functioning uh, economic paradigm um, and, and the environment right now. Perhaps, Denise, uh, for ICSE, uh, could you share your thoughts about this question? Um, what's wrong with the economy and, and how did we get here? I think uh, we we can compare this to how the world is grappling right now with, with COVID-19. We might all be in the same storm, but not all of us are in good sturdy boats. There are some communities uh, and economies for that matter that are able to to ride through the waves, are, are safe and dry. Whereas there are other economies uh, which are uh, poorer and, and less prepared and have uh, less capacity to, to ride out the storm, to ride out the waves. 
that's a very good analogy, I guess, with the COVID pandemic, because um, we already see which countries are uh, grappling with that problem and having a difficult time. And it's not surprising that these are probably the same companies who are also having a hard time uh, with what's happening with our climate. Um, Authority Alan, do you have any thoughts uh, with your company, your, your green economy already? Um, how do you see the world and uh, why, what does your company want to change about it? As you mentioned, we are the Energy Development Corporation. We are the, uh, the largest geothermal uh, producer in the Philippines. No? Climate crisis is very real to, to us, no? not, not only um, as a company, but um, you know, as a corporate citizen no? and also as a stakeholder in the local community. So um, while uh, geothermal is our biggest um, renewable energy uh, product, no? we ventured into other forms of renewable energy as well. No? Um, and then this became a, a conscious effort for us to, to stick to renewable energy, which is why um, we have four contributions to, uh, to the green economy. Number one, um, we produce renewable energy and we are avoiding um, you know, carbon uh, emission. Second, um, we are protecting our forest no? uh, and we avoid deforestation. Third, um, we, we just don't protect the forest. We grow them, no? we enhance them through our Binhi program. And so far we have planted 10,000 hectares no? uh, all over the Philippines. No? And, um, and last but not the least, the fourth one is we're trying to influence other companies to, um, to go um, to pursue the path of decarbonization, uh, uh, meaning to lower their emission um, at the same time, try to offset their emission. No? You know, for us, um, 2013 was a, a very uh, a big moment for us. No? That was the, um, the Yolanda, no? the, the strongest typhoon that hit the Philippines. No? Um, it was called Typhoon Haiyan uh, worldwide. No? And, and Typhoon Yolanda made us realize that we are very vulnerable to uh, the impacts of climate change. No? So during that time, our geothermal facilities in Leyte got destroyed, completely destroyed. No? Not just the operation of EBC, but our communities. No? Um, it, it wrecked uh, so much damage to our, to our communities. No? And then we realized we need to do something. No? So which is why in 2016, we made the pronouncement to not to invest in any coal project, but, but to stick to renewable energy. And, and this became our defining moment to, to invest in more renewable energy in the Philippines. So we, we expanded our RE portfolio, so not just geothermal, but we ventured into solar, wind, and hydro uh, power as, as a, a producer of electricity in the Philippines. Thank you, Attorney Alan. That's very inspiring to hear. Denise, uh, how would you explain it to some people, for example, as such a devastating event or extreme weather event such as Typhoon Yolanda, how would you connect it uh, to our economy? Why would you say, uh, could we say that the economy has a direct link or is at fault for what had happened to Yolanda or other places as well? The status quo, the way we have designed the global economy as it is, uh, it's, it's really geared towards constant taking and not so much about letting people, communities, resources thrive. That spells uh, tragedy for, for ordinary people uh, when their uh, governments or their power systems have locked into fossil fuel technologies. Consumers have, have no way of uh, or have little recourse but to accept the, the system as it is. Then uh, we are the ones. Uh, ordinary consumers are the ones who will who will pay for uh, for this short cycle. How do you see uh, these kinds of um, discussions about the vested interests, I guess, on the economy and how it's uh, prohibiting us from really transitioning to a green economy? It's supposed to be a uh, a collect collective commitment, no, to bring down our level of emission and to contribute to the to the to the fight against global warming and, and climate crisis, no. So um, again, there are many ways. Um, as a country, we need to commit to involve all sectors of society you know, and, and companies for, um, to, to take the path um, to decarbonization. You know. the, the key here is to be, to be aware. You know, and, and this awareness hopefully will translate to more action. The Global South, I think, is grappling with that problem, right? Um, I, I'm curious, Zara, about Malaysia. How is your economy like? Are there 
any moves towards a green economy? Is this a problem also that your government is thinking of? In Malaysia, as a country, we're very reliant on natural resources. We have a lot of oil and gas, um, and we also also have a lot of palm oil. Um, so these are the two kind of main issues with us for transitioning to a green economy. But we have had our major oil and gas company, Petronas, in the last year, they have actually announced that they would be moving to net zero, um, an oil and gas company moving to net zero by 2050. Um, so I think that's, that's a very good, um, it's a very good sign that things are going the, the right way in Malaysia. It's a big journey for us um, transitioning. You know, we, we have to move away from the old ways. Um, we're, we're moving more into kind of um, into service sectors, uh, financial sector to get away from, from our natural resources uh, based economy. Thanks, Zara. We're already talking about the green economy here. Um, but what exactly is the green economy? Is it just the energy sector? Uh, what does it entail? I think there's not really one kind of um, description of green economy or one idea of what a green economy is. Um, and I think in most people's minds, a green economy is a low carbon economy, um, one that takes care of the environment, one take, that takes care of the people, especially. Um, and so you would be looking at kind of green technology, um, a change in the way we're living. But I think Importantly as well, for me, the green economy also takes into account the things that nature does for us. So I did, um, I did mention earlier the goods and services provided by nature. So I think it's really important that those, the, the value of those goods and services um, is accounted for in, in our economy. And then that also helps bring about a green economy. So one example of that is, for example, um, if you have a forest and you're just looking at the value of the timber for the forest, then you're going to obviously think that cutting down that forest is the main way to build your economy to move forward. But um, once you understand actually that the forest is providing us with fresh air, it's providing us with fresh water, it's mitigating floods, um, it's mitigating droughts, then you understand that that forest actually maybe brings a bigger value as a standing forest. And that's when you start realizing that as part of your economy, you need that forest. Um, so to me, that's kind of what an, a green economy also entails. Thanks, Zara. Um, it actually reminds me of what we call in journalism as like having a climate lens or environmental lens when you're when you're tackling certain stories. So that's an interesting perspective. Um, Denise, uh, what is your take on the green economy? Again, as Sarah said, there's uh, there's not really uh, one set definition for this. But I, I wanted to come in to to actually contest the notion of a green economy, um, much like. Uh, the notion of a green economy. Uh, we believe that an inclusive, resilient development based on a modern, efficient economy responsive to the needs of the majority. We believe that this is the goal. So among its many co-benefits might be a contribution to global decarbonization, gentler kind of development, protection of biodiversity, clean air, clean water, healthier citizens. This goal of a, of a green economy must only be a co-benefit. It's really long-term development. It's really uh, truly uh, uh, resilient um, recovery from COVID and the flattening of the COVID and climate curves towards long-term development. That's that's the goal. I think it's more of a holistic approach, right? Uh, really just thinking of what would benefit the people. That's the bottom line, you know. We don't need um, terms like that. You know, just think of the of what we can do for the future generation. Um, with everything that's happening now, with the transition for some companies, for some economies, what are the problems that could arise when it comes to having this kind of economy that's low carbon, that will benefit us in the long term? Perhaps, Attorney Allen, um, did you have any, um, did you encounter any problems with your company as well when you were starting up? Yeah, uh, b before I answer that, Christine, I, I also like to contribute to the conversation about green economy. You know, um, Denise and, and Sarah already mentioned about, you know, about the some attributes of green economy, like low carbon, socially inclusive, um, developing, uh, you know, enhancing nature to provide, um, to enhance its capacity to provide goods and services, right? So um, in, in, in the case of EDC, you know, um, 
more than producing renewable energy, uh, we have been also trying to, um, you know, to, to protect our forests no? and, and to even enhance them. No? Protecting the forest is very strategic to a geothermal business because if there's no forest, there's no watersheds, then your geothermal steam will not become sustainable in the long run. No? It will deplete. So it's part of our um, strategy and sustainability model to really protect our forests no? and not just protect, but enhance them. No? And, and to me, that's, that's also part of... Um, green economy, not just to, uh, to do less harm, uh, but to produce more positive outcomes, no? um, to benefit your, your stakeholders, be it the environment or the community. No? So to, to us, it goes beyond sustainability. It, it's, you know, it's creating regenerative outcomes. No? So, so that's my take on, on, on green economy. But to your question about some challenges, um, yeah, uh, in, in the beginning, you know, you know it's, it's very hard to develop geothermal um, uh, operation in the Philippines, as as you know, it takes time to um, to have a, a geothermal project because number one, you need to explore, you need to test the wells, you need to um, you know you need to clear some areas, you need to make sure that your footprint is very low, you need to minimize your impact uh, on the environment, uh, you need to engage the communities, so th- that was the hard part, no. Um, but after, after you do that, no, um, then it becomes easy. Uh, operating the geothermal business becomes easy. So there's a, there's a, a challenge in terms of, you know, there's a, a lo- very long gestation of setting up a geothermal project. More particularly that our geothermal um, resources are located in the, in the mountains no? where, where the steam are located. So there are challenges in terms of uh, engaging the communities, making sure that uh, we include them in the in the development model. No? So for EDC, um, we, we we have always involved the communities no? in terms of uh, you know trying to protect the environment uh, as well. So in, in, in the case of the Binhi program, our forest restoration program, we made them partners. No? Uh, in, in fact, this, um, these farmers are what we call in, in the Philippines the kaingineros. No? They, they, they depend on the forest. So they convert the forest into agricultural uh, cultivation and, and they cut the trees and they burn the ground. So that, that's, that was a very destructive practice before, but we tried to convert them into uh, forest protectors and partners. So we involved them not just in the planting of seedlings, but, but also in protecting and maintaining the trees. No? And then now they're, they're into other forms of livelihood. No? They're now planting coffee, uh, cacao. They, they have... Um, uh, bamboo project, no, all because they, they also benefit from environmental programs and, and they see that protecting the environment is also protecting the community. So, uh, again, this, this contributes to you know, um, uh, greening our environment and ultimately greening the economy and help mitigate climate uh, crisis. One of the issues about the idea of the decarbonization is that people will lose jobs. So, it's nice to hear about how you know people are actually getting these jobs that are helpful for the sustainability of our forests. Denise, I wanted to ask as well about what's actually preventing countries from fully transitioning. Like, what are the challenges that you're seeing for companies like EDC? Uh, a lack of political will. So while we are seeing uh, bigger and bigger companies like like uh, EDC and others. Um, already grasping uh, the opportunities, we do see how the administration and the Senate and Congress of, of uh, the Philippines taking steps to ensure that we actually attract more renewable energy investments. But the playing field um, is still not leveled off. Um, there are still uh, more loopholes, more subsidies for, for uh, given to, to the coal oil and uh, we're, we're um, seeing dynamics for, for fossil gas. There's this energy financing gap. There's, uh, there's still this um, red tape for renewable energy product. You have to really challenge the status quo. A lot of students, a lot of the youth are listening to us. What do we envision in this green economy or an economy that is just more sustainable for for our population, for for the whole planet. Um, This will be my last question as well. So if you want to add additional messages or your message for the youth, you know, just inspire them and give them hope that, you know, change is possible. 
and we're already seeing um, good changes in small pockets around the world. We've shown that it can be done, right? So it's it's, it's a matter of committing, no? and and this commitment should um, should come from a realization that climate change is real, no? and we are all affected by the impact of climate change. No? Profit and purpose can can go uh, together, and uh, while we are a private company that's uh, try to earn. We should always be conscious of our impact uh, on the environment, uh, on the communities, and, and you know, and, and on the world. No, commit to a regenerative lifestyle. Thank you so much, Attorney Alan, and thank you for EDC for you know giving us a glimpse of what's possible for businesses. You know, it's possible to marry a business and doing good for the community and and society as well. Um, Denise, um, how about for ICSC? Um, what do you envision um, for our future? We, we envision now uh, what we call in Filipino as paginhawaan, having just enough, not, not too much. Thanks, Denise. And I wanted to thank ICSC also. I know you have a lot of work in island communities, as you've mentioned, about renewable energy there. And it's a game changer, I think, uh, what you're doing, um, providing uh, solar panels, uh, even generators to the small communities. Um, that were previously unconnected to the power grid. Thanks for that, Denise. Um, Zara, perhaps you can also talk about WWF. Uh, what have you guys been doing towards uh, green economy and what, what do you envision for our future? We honestly believe in, in WWF. If we don't have sustainable palm oil, we'll have to rely on other forms of oil. Um, and that itself is also going to be massively destructive. So we, we need to work on being as efficient as we can, as, as environmentally friendly as we can um, to produce the things that we need as a society. Green economy should be one that's fair for everybody and where everybody gets to enjoy um, well-being and health and happiness as well. I'm very thankful that we were able to discuss all of these different perspectives. We now go back to our student panel and to get their insights on what we have been able to discuss. Uh, Jelan, Tristan, and Patricia, do any of you would want to give feedback on what our least first persons uh, talked about? Um, I, will, I want to share you about the fact in Indonesia a little. Uh, in fact, in Indonesia, there are many small business, or we call it UMKM, that run the green economic concept. But there are still many limitations, such as lack of investment, lack of information, aren't exposed enough, and some of their product is still strange to the consumer and maybe more pricey, expensive than the regular product, which is not an eco-friendly product. We must work together to pursue this green economic concept. Thank you, Jinan. Definitely, you're correct. It's so hard at the start, right? Um, but as our, uh, our speakers have mentioned, uh, it will get easier once we go over that hump. Um, how about Patricia? Through your talks or through your insights and sharings, I realized that there are really risks in whatever solutions we come up with. I mean, risks are really inevitable. Some ordinary communities are at risk once the shift has been made. So I really think um, that we need to come up with a good system. And I love how Attorney Allen's company has already been doing their best to create that good system of, of producing or creating a positive outcome. So I hope more companies learn from this and be more inspired to also do the same for our society. It just follows, you know, if, if our perspective when it comes to economy, when it comes to business is to make it more sustainable and really helpful for the society. Uh, finally, we have Tristan. Maybe I can share a little about what I'm into now. I'm joining a competition right now in Indonesia, in my town. It's Youth Entrepreneurship Competition. And it's basically about presenting a new business plan. And my team come up with this idea where the waste used of cooking oil turned into biodiesel. Well, so it catches these points where we open up jobs, encourage income while reducing pollution and waste, especially the waste used of cooking oil and yet turned into biodiesel oil. And from my team's observations of this business idea, my country, Indonesia, produced at least 1,800 million liters of cooking oil that could actually be turned into 1,400 
million liters of biodiesel, which of course will generate a lot of revenue anyway, and it's just in Indonesia. Actually, this business idea has already been realized, or it may have spread a lot. The business idea that our team created is not just managed by large restaurants, hotels, and large companies that produce large amounts of cooking oil only, but even housewives and small stalls can join this business. They earn money by collecting used of cooking oil, and um, the green economy reminds me of these idioms, kill two birds with one stone. And from what I've captured, this green economy turns out to be a lot of benefits, and it is a big change to both the environment and the and the economy. What if the whole world were implementing this green economy uh, and the world is bound to get even better? Thank you, Tripsen. Uh, thank you to our students for enriching our discussion today. And I think uh, it's a fitting end to this discussion, what Tristan said about uh, how the youth are also thinking about what the businesses of tomorrow would be. You know, uh, the students now will be the businessmen of tomorrow. They will be building our societies in the future. And what we're doing now, um, influencing their perspectives about what a, what a good business should be like, what a good economy could look like. Um, that's, that's very inspiring. So thank you again for our resource persons for joining us today. And that's it for this episode, but here's what we have for you next. We're here is a great effort rather than just being quiet and doing nothing. We can come up with the framework. All this we should do in a just transition. There is hope for this. Never forget how powerful your voice can be. Here we continue to believe that you will be extraordinary people. I'm Christine Sabillo. Thank you for listening. We hope this episode inspires you to take action to save not just Asia, but our planet. Join our community of climate advocates through Climate Tracker Asia's WhatsApp group or by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Join us for another insightful discussion next time on Saving Asia.